Hi, welcome to this mini lecture on different schools of thought about design thinking for social innovation, social impact, systems change, and social justice. We will talk about four, recognizing that there are more out there, and this just helps you see some different possible flavors, a few syntheses and some critical perspectives. These also offer different roles for each of you, new kinds of organizations to work in. And along the way, get a few examples to see how these approaches contribute to finding new ways to address complex, wicked problems. From adolescent reproductive health in West Africa, to public spaces in Europe, farming in China, and racist urban structures in the United States. First, we talk about mainstream human-centered design for social innovation, which you've already encountered, and then systems-minded and human-centered human -centered design. Both are associated with Bay Area, California, design and innovation organizations. Then I introduce diffuse design for sustainability. This is for citizen action in social innovation coming out of a global network of designers for sustainability. And finally, we end back in the US with equity-centered community design from the Critical Reaction Lab in St. Louis. And they're tackling systemic injustices with youth. You have some readings behind these and there's also optional websites to visit. So the mainstream model of design thinking for social innovation, I believe is best illustrated by the ideal model of human-centered design or Here Create Deliver HCD from the global for-profit IDEO design firm and their spin-off IDEO.org, a 501c3 nonprofit. They get their funding from the Gates Foundation, from Hewlett Foundation, other foundations, and they partner with organizations like Marie Stopes International, Adolescent or A360, um, PSI, Population Service International, and other global health and development partners. And they also work with US-based health, education, and financial sector organizations. And they do promote capacity building for social sector via their human-centered design field guide or, or their design kit, which you can find in Canvas. And they support the PLUS Acumen or Acumen Academy global online course. I can tell you more about that in class. So as a nonprofit design studio, IDEO.org grew out of the global design firm whose help founders helped start the Stanford D School, the Institute, Institute of Design, and who can be considered in a sense the fathers of some strands of design thinking. And IDEO.org partners with, as I mentioned, various foundations, um, and they've been working with um, on their own in the U.S. to develop new solutions to challenges like reimagining youth mental health health care. And they're listening to young people and bringing some new thinking to that space. So check that out on their website. Um, it's called Aspire, I believe. Okay, and they've also been working on adolescent reproductive health and other topics. And you could see that they're generally designing experiences rather than products. In Global Health, there's a website and an article um, that mentions this focus on reproductive health in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they mention learning from DIVA centers in Zambia and about their mistakes in the process. And now they have a large, much larger collaboration with PSI and others to make up this network called A360, Adolescent 360. You could see the, uh, the website there. And you can see mindsets and methods that you are already learning through the, um, the kind of crash course, the period activity you did. And um, in, this, in this sketch, for example, a sketch of, of contraceptive method out, outreach reach and how they've got these rapid prototypes that they're testing. And so if you're interested in health promotion, check out this work and identify what is perhaps new or different or relevant or just maybe better handled as, uh, to reach the beneficiaries. As part of the global health industry, they're paying attention to monitoring and evaluation as well, which is the picture on the right. And um, they say that they've got some thoughts on what's an appropriate monitoring and evaluation to embrace and, and integrate human-centered design into a public health um, intervention. So if you are an IHSD student and interested in m and &E particularly, check that out. So again, their big project, A360, it tackles major challenge of access to contraceptives for young women in Nigeria, Tanzania, and other African nations. This is a, 
screenshot of an infographic they created around contraceptives for adolescent women. For years, the language was family planning, and that kind of referred to distant futures and perhaps staying healthy. So solid and reliable and appropriate and kind of uninspiring and maybe disconnected with the youth. So based on a lot of ethnographic work, much more in-depth interviews with lots of young women, the designers from IDEO.org and others working with A360 found out why that message was not resonating deeply with these young women, these adolescents. So this led to some new language, a new framing that's addressing current needs, current plans and expectations for these girls. Like in this infographic here, you can see um, some of the different language. Your current needs are important, so it isn't just about the distant future. So you might ask, is it working? And do we need rather expensive global nonprofit design studios and their experts to bring this kind of thinking to public health? Yes and no. Um, I'm not sure, but give it some thought. My hope is that you see design thinking as leading to some new insights from outside some of our conventional norms and ways of working, and that it complements evidence-based public health practices. In fact, we can see that design thinking is significant and respectful and a relevant way to enhance mainstream global health programming to better serve beneficiaries, whether as the direct end users of a program or indirectly through the systems like health providers that reach them. So it draws on evidence, but this is evidence about emotions and feelings and yearnings. It's less narrowly about targeting practical medical and health outcomes directly, per se. So what do you think about that? Check out IDEO.org and check out related applications like the HCD Exchange, which is very much focused on adolescent reprodu reproductive health in the Global South. Moving along, Thomas Both is the author of one reading about systems-minded and human-centered design. He presents a synthesis of systems, practices, and mindsets like empathy and rapid prototyping in a context of bigger picture thinking. An example he uses is of a social entrepreneur, Jill Violet, and her social innovation, in this case, um, addressing substitute teacher shortages. She was also the founder of uh, Playworks, which is bringing recess to schools. So Thomas both makes the case that Jill Violet used systems thinking to embrace the bigger challenge and find the right problem to solve using design thinking. So check out this quadrant and it has eight questions. I think this is a um, really important article. This approach resonates with me as a planner and scholar and it relates to some of my teaching and it's kind of how I structured the course. So what do you think? Another school of thought comes from a European designer, Ezio Manzini, who's founder of a global network of design educators and institutions from Milan, Italy, to Beijing, and other cities of China, from Sao Paulo to New York, and others. It's called the Design for Social Innovation and Sustainability Network, it's a DESIS network. They operate, um, they operate from a more communitarian philosophical stance that values public sector action and is infusing the education of designers to be more varied in their roles than just expert designers for and with design, global design firms brought in as, as consultants, so to speak, on, a, on an intervention. In this case, Manzini and the DESIS Network see designers might be humble facilitators for a citizen-led pro process, or design activists advocating for a really just cause. So the reading by Manzini makes a case for design for social innovation emerging from different levels. And he gives some examples from the food system, the slow food movement and mental health, and even rural China and bottom-up agricultural innovations. And he calls for new ways to train these professional expert designers to work more effectively with citizens as lay or diffuse designers. And Manzini recognizes the place for this public or widespread training in design thinking for all people to better understand and be part of designing, just like you are engaging with now. So you might be leading citizen-led action here in New Orleans. You could be more informed and active participants in these designs led by cities or government agencies, right? So you, your roles could be the citizens in a process or could be collaborating as facilitators with other um, community members. So some examples from this network. So this is a crowdsourcing platform. The Design for Sustainability and Social Innovation 
network covers a lot of territory from overhauling our food systems to public participation in civic planning to new models of care for aging and more. And this spans fields like service design or experience design or user experience and digital design and other related design fields. And responding to COVID-19 over the past years, we see examples of concepts emerging out of this network of students and educators and facilitators of design coming up with examples of um, ways to promote well-being and mental health. And here's one that stood out, dealing with procrastination based on observations that remote work at home under, undermines morale and incentives, making independent artists and creative types, for example, tend to procrastinate. So cool examples from the DESIS website. Um, you can see from the names, these are teams of people from around the world who are collaborating online. Here's one that might resonate with, with many of you. It's a concept to help plan your routines better, noticing that we're struggling to have daily routines that work for us, which has started with the COVID lockdown and those tremendous shifts to the more vague, unsettled uncertainty we're seeing these days. And I noticed this was a, a challenge framing that came up for you that your designers noticed for you as users during your paired activity. So you're not alone. And you can think of the DESIS platform as an open source co-design inviting people around the world to contribute to finding ways to solve these really common, maybe kind of mundane challenges, but with deeper insights and empathy. I find it moving and relevant that around the world we see these similar concerns to what you noticed in our class workshop. And I hope you can start to see how designing for a specific user, while it might seem too idiosyncratic, can actually scale up to designs for many similar users around the world through virtual networks, right? So this is a different kind of community. It's not a geographic outsider looking at a community, but it's a, a virtual community created by our common needs through um, connecting through technology. Okay, let's shift gears to our fourth school of thought of design for innovation, specifically social innovation and social justice, here changing systems of oppression and injustice, specifically in urban USA. And by critical, by critical perspective, we mean bringing explicit attention to power. Who has it? Think of Marx's thought around power as an oppressive force over others, of the patriarchy, over the workers, um, sorry, uh, um, capitalist industrialists over the workers, or patriarchy of men over women, for example, those are power over others. And then a couple weeks ago, we saw Eric Liu's video, which is about citizen power. And he's basically trying to cultivate change makers and invite us to think of our civic power as ability to do things and enable action often together in the public sector, right? So finding your power. So those are some critical, critical perspectives, bring attention to power, the nature of it, who has it, um, that it isn't necessarily zero sum and that we can um, mobilize our power together. And in, and in this case, critical perspectives around design are trying to bring that together with design mindsets to unpack oppressive systems. A good example of this is Creative Reaction Lab, a nonprofit organization based in St. Louis, Missouri, founded by Antoinette D. Carroll. She's building an intergener intergenerational movement of redesigners for justice. And she hopes to co-create and reimagine a world in which racial equity and health equity are the status quo. She's seeing that systems of oppression, inequality, inequity are by design, so they can be redesigned. We need a new leader, she says, a new type of leader that leverages the history of youth being the architects of change, the agitators of the status quo of exclusion, erasure, and oppression. Carol and her associates created the Equity Centered Community Design, ECCD framework, and it integrates what you will now recognize as kind of classic human-centered design mindsets of empathy and creative confidence and rapid prototyping or biased action into a framework grounded in awareness of identity and power, noticing the history of oppression facing many communities in the US, many. African-American neighborhoods and cities in particular. The assigned reading for the week is short, really. It's a field guide and you have the electronic version and the paper version is about this big and it's tiny and you can buy it for 
a little bit of money from their website. And the guide um, is short, so they want you to read it, they want you to use it, right? Take it with you. And the guide walks you through their approach for new equity designers to do the work of designing to dismantle systems of oppression in a community with members of the local community. In other words, we're talking about more of a geographically focused community, not a virtual community necessarily. So this is not a long read since it's just a pocket guide with some worksheets and space for writing. So think about that as you're looking at it on the screen, it's actually meant to be printed out and held in your hand and used as you walk around the streets. And as you read, you can connect the ECCD process framework that where you start and how you proceed through these, these um, different modes, right? With other frameworks like we've seen already. So the empathy define ideate prototype test or the discover, dream, do, different language, but they're very similar, right? So you can see how it also overlaps with concept of power by Eric Liu and integrates those two together, right? So I think this ECC, ECCD is a great framework for our context and challenge going forward, specifically our partner, Mike Amped and the work of, of reaching youth. So there are others as well, but this is the one that I'm introducing to you now. Okay, to recap, these diverse schools capture different philosophical stances on the place of design in society to promote well-being. And the mainstream sits within the established US culture of nonprofit action funded by private philanthropy that is kind of assumed to, to work pretty well, which is bringing in design. And the examples of work by IDEO.org are in inspiring or catalyzing improvements in current services for mental health and youth in the US, adolescent healthcare in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And we can even see examples of this approach being taken up in medical care, in um, the, the VA innovation lab and, and a government innovation lab that teaches federal, federal employees around the US these methods of design thinking as human-centered design. And this mainstream approach reflects opportunities in integrating design thinking into global health and development for poorer populations around the world. And we've seen these evolve over the last decade and they're growing and learning. They're paying more attention to evaluation of designs for health, for example. Meanwhile, the critical perspective reflects critical social theory and social justice aims of equity with attention to power in different forms. And it's really challenging that mainstream model in its alignment with inequitable societal structures and systems. So I see the critical reaction lab pretty much challenging and asking the mainstream model to, to shift and, and address its white supremacy and, and privilege and use the design mindsets, but within, the, within a um, new perspective on identity and, and systems change. And the other school I introduced is the citizen-led sector or, or diffuse design, which reflects theories of design as human creativity and abilities to make stuff that anyone can do and anyone should be able to do and as being supported by professionals, professional designers in different roles with their skills and time and energy to complement citizen action. So designers could be facilitators or designers could be activists, right? The designers don't own the designs for other people. So this idea of diffuse design from Manzini and, the, and embodied in the DESA's network is grounded in communitarian versus individualistic mental models. Think about that iceberg approach. What's at the bottom? How do individuals relate to each other and to society? So these communitarian, more public oriented ways of designing are, are um, coming out of Europe and, and Asia. So the readings give you a bare glimpse into these ways of thinking and the cultures and institutions they represent and where they come from and some of the practices they are engaged in. As public health professionals entering the US or global health arenas, you have a variety of options ahead of you, but all of them should embrace empathy and collaboration and rapid prototyping and constant learning and testing. And I, I look forward to hearing your reactions to these schools of thought. And in class, we'll discuss these and use your, you'll be using your assignment to figure out which schools of thought you resonate with or align with or can see helpful in your specific job search. And I'm not proffering or, or promoting one or the other, but just recognizing that they're there and they, they exist in different realms. So that's about it. Um, enjoy the readings and I'll see you in class.